All right, so 2 Kings chapter 5, if you would please stand in honor of God's word. Phenomenal, wonderful, wonderful scripture. Just great story that we find in the life of Elisha that, that speaks volumes to us. The Bible says, now Naaman, captain of the host of the king of Syria, in other words, he was the lead general, he was the commander-in-chief of the forces of Syria, was a great man with his master, and he was honorable because by him the Lord had given deliverance unto Syria. He was also a mighty man in valor, but he was a leper. And the Syrians had gone out by companies and had brought away captives out of the land of Israel, a little maid, and she waited on Naaman's wife. And she said unto her mistress, Would God my Lord were with the prophet that is in Samaria, for he would recover him of his leprosy, or heal him of his leprosy. Let's bow for a word of prayer. Father, thank you so very much for how this story just literally leaps off the page at us. And God, I thank you that you had your hand on Naaman long before he ever knew you had your hand on him. And God, I pray that you would impress on our hearts today that, God, there's nobody here by mistake. God, I believe you've drawn every person here. You've got a message for their heart. And it's a very simple message. It's not hard to understand. But I pray that we will apply it to our lives. So speak to us today, and we will give you glory. For it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. You may be seated. I want to read a psalm to you, Psalm 139. It was written by King David, and I believe it applies to each of us because it does apply to King David, all right? He writes, and this is in the New Living Translation. He says, O Lord, you have examined my heart, and you know everything about me. You know when I sit down or when I stand up. So according to the word of God, God knew when you stood up to read the scripture, and he knew when you sat back down. And during invitation, when you stand back up, he's going to know that too. That's pretty cool, isn't it? You know when I sit down, you know when I stand up. You know my thoughts even from when I'm far, far away. You see me when I travel, and you see me when I rest at home. You know everything I do. You know what I'm going to say before I even say it, Lord. You go before me and you follow me. You place your hand of blessing on my head. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It's too great for me to understand. I can never escape from your spirit. I can never get away from your presence. So in other words, David, and he goes on to say, God, you formed me. You made me when I was in my mama's tummy. When I got little fingers and little toes, you wrote them in a book. God, you know everything about me. And he says, it literally blows my mind when I think of all that you know about me. I believe everybody in here is created absolutely different from anybody else in the world. you got a fingerprint that's different than anybody else's fingerprint. Your DNA structure is different than anybody else's on the face of this earth. Your retinal scan is different than anybody else on the face of this earth. And I'll promise you, nobody else looks like you <laughs> or me. We're different. We're all different. None of us look the same. Even you have identical twins. They still have differences even among them. And the Bible says that God knows everything about us. I'm a firm believer that it's no accident to God that we came to worship today. I also believe that he orchestrates details in my life. Now, God will never force me to worship him. He will never force me to have a grateful heart. God will never force me to forgive someone or to even crack a smile when the preacher says something funny. But I do believe that God will place you in the position where you have the opportunity to worship where you have the opportunity to forgive those that hurt you, or where you have the opportunity to be thankful and even in the opportunity to crack a smile if something funny is said. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to look at the life of Naaman, who was not an Israelite. He lived in the land of Syria and, and see God's hand in his life. So my first point will be your location is no accident. I don't believe it's by accident that you're here today. I don't believe it's by accident that you're hearing this message. It is not by accident that you are where you are, that you live where you live, where, that you work where you work. All right? Take a look at Naaman, 2 Kings chapter 5, verse 1. This is the scripture. 
Now Naaman, captain of the host of the king of Syria, was a great man with his master and honorable because by him the Lord had given deliverance unto Syria. In other words, he was in good with the king because God gave him a favorable heart. He was in good with other people because God had given him victories. God already had his hand on Naaman before Naaman ever knew who Jehovah God was. He was a mighty man in valor, but he was also a leper. I don't believe it's by accident that God gave Naaman the victory in Israel. The Bible says that he was the sword of God's wrath. That as Israel disobeyed God, that God allowed the Syrian army to come in and to spank the Israelites, trying to get them to turn back into revival, but they would not. When they went down to the land of Israel, it just so happened that they took several slaves. One of those slaves just so happened to be the servant girl of Naaman's wife. So Naaman's wife is probably saying, man, that leprosy is killing my husband. If there were just something we could do, if there was some doctor, if there was something we could do. And this itty bitty little tiny, probably a little teenage girl who, who's probably thinking, why am I in Syria? I've got stolen from my family. I don't know what I'm doing here. And suddenly she pops up and says, you know, I've got a wonderful preacher. She said, if my preacher man were here, the prophet Elisha, he could do something about this leprosy. He could give you the answer to, do you think that's accident? Do you think it's accident that a little girl that knew Elisha would just be taken captive and put in the household of Naaman so that this could be, I don't believe that's by accident. I believe God designed for that to take place. I don't anymore believe that was an accident than that Zacchaeus was in the right tree at the right time when Jesus came by. It was no accident when the rooster crowed three times within the hearing of Peter before the sun came up on the day Jesus was crucified. It's not by accident that that rooster was there. It's not by accident that you're here. Many years ago, it was no accident that I heard Billy Johnson at the Titus County Fair singing southern gospel music on a stage as I sat on the hillside and ate a corny dog. <laughs> and I said, man, that guy can sing. So we were looking for a music director. We asked him if he'd be our music director. He said, no. <laughs> a year later, we were without a music director again. We went back to him and got it, spanked him a little bit. And we said, would you be our music director? He said, oh, yes, please let me come. And we've been working together for the past 25 years. It was no accident that I met Brother Park eating breakfast with a mutual friend. He said, do you mind if my buddy comes over and eats with us? I said, no, that's fine. It was Brother Park. And we struck up a friendship over 25 years ago. And now, joy of all joys, I get the opportunity to work with him as my associate. I love Brother Park. I think God has been directing our paths. I think he's been directing your path and my path to the people we cross paths with. It's no accident that you're where you're at that you live in that neighborhood, that you work where you work, that that person next to you is working with you. Second thing, I think our heart's desire should also be no accident. So as the story goes, the little slave girl overhears a conversation and says, if my preacher were there, he'd heal him. He's Elisha. He lives in Israel, and the prophet of Israel can heal him if he wanted to. So by verse 9, Naaman loads up. Brother, he takes off for Elisha's house. He just so happens to, to, to believe this little girl. He goes, man, I'm going to go down there, and I'm going to see if this guy can really heal me. And, and he must believe it because he takes a bunch of gold, he takes a bunch of silver, and he takes 10 brand-new suits from J.C. Penney's down there to take to, 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 to Elisha to show his sincerity and, and, and to hopefully pay him to, to heal him. So now you got to remember something. Here's the point of this, and, and you got to think. I know we don't do that often, but we're going to this morning. What was his purpose? What was his heart's desire? Naaman's heart's desire was to be healed. Y'all say that with me. To be healed. Naaman went to be healed. That's what he went for. 
So let's pick up the story. 2 Kings chapter 5, verse 9. So Naaman came with his horses and with his chariots, and he stood at the door of the house of Elisha. And Elisha sent a messenger unto him, saying, Go wash in the Jordan River seven times, and thy flesh shall come again, and thou shalt be clean. This is how you get healed. This is how you get the desire of your heart that is to be healed. Go dunk in the Jordan River seven times, and you're going to be healed. But Naaman got angry and went away and said, Behold, I thought he would surely come out and that he would stand and that he would call upon the name of the Lord his God and that he'd strike his hand over the place and that he would recover the leper. I thought he'd come out with a tambourine and shake it at me a little bit. I thought he'd blow smoke on me or throw holy water on me or chant and wave his hands and put a big show going on and the band would strike up and the organ would play and everybody get all excited. He'd slay a few folks in the spirit and he'd come over there and touch me and grab me and I'd be healed. He didn't even come out on the porch. He said, are not Abana and Farpar rivers of Damascus better than all the waters of Israel? Can't I wash in them and be clean? So he turned away and went away in a rage. So you got to get this important lesson. When Elisha did not honor Naaman, Naaman forgot his heart's desire and got angry. Again, what was Naaman's heart's desire? To be healed. The general said, He offended me. He didn't even come out and say hi to me. He didn't do what I expected him to do. He didn't meet my expectations. And Naaman almost missed being healed because he forgot the desire of his heart and let his pride take over. Woo! So let's look at the desire of a heart that should be no accident because the desire of my heart should be the desire of God's heart. Psalm 10, 17, Lord, thou hast heard the desires of the humble. Thou would prepare their heart, thou would cause thine ear to hear. The Bible says that the desire of your heart, when you Come to the Lord in your prayer closet. He literally cups his hand to his ear and prepares to hear you. He wants to make absolutely sure that he hears the desire of your heart. And they would say, oh, I want to be healed. And God goes, I heard that. I heard it. I got it. I got it right there. That God would hear. He prepares to hear those desires. Psalm 21, 1. The king shall joy in thy strength, O Lord, and in thy salvation, how greatly shall he rejoice. Thou hast given him his heart's desire and has not withholding the request of his lips. Say, la, so there. What do you think about that, the psalmist says? The desires of your heart, when they're in line with God's desires, God wants to give them to you. Somehow we've gotten this idea that, that God puts a desire of your heart and he just dangles it and goes, I'm not giving it to you. <laughs> I'm just going to torture you with it. That's not what scripture says. Psalm 37, 3, one of my favorite verses. Trust in the Lord and do good. So shalt thou dwell in the land, and verily thou shalt be fed. Delight thyself also in the Lord, and he shall give thee the desires of thine heart. You read that again? Delight thyself also in the Lord, and he shall give thee the desires of thine heart. Commit thy way unto the Lord, trust also in him, and he shall bring it to pass. I love this. God will give you the desires of your heart when? When you delight yourself in the Lord. Take your eyes off the desires and put it on the delight, and that's the Lord. Commit thy way unto the Lord. Trust in him, and he shall bring it to pass. So you say, well, what is your heart's desire? Forgiveness? Restoration? Peace? Joy? Healing? Healing of your marriage? Healing of your heart? healing of your ministry, then quit being distracted by the color of the carpet or by someone else's behavior. 
I'm going to say that again because that deserves a really good amen. If you're seeking your heart's desire that is in line with God's desire, your delight needs to be found in the Lord and get your eyes off what other people are doing. Amen. Then we go, well, Elisha didn't. Quit looking at it. Elisha didn't come out of the porch. I believe he did intentionally. He said, I don't even want you to look at me. But he got angry. Oh, my soul. And here's the thing. Elisha had nothing, he had done nothing wrong. He was walking his own path. He didn't do anything to offend this guy. In fact, he told him how to be healed. He said, that's how you be healed. What do I need to come out there for? I'm not going to shake a tambourine. I'm not going to throw holy water on you. I'm just going to tell you, go do this and you'll be healed. But Naaman would blame him for not getting his heart's desire. It's Elisha's fault. That's what he was doing. Until some of his men came up and said, hey, this is really simple. <laughs> that guy's not offending you. He just told you what to do. What if he told you to go climb Mount Everest? What if he go told you to whoop two lions and a bear? You would have done that. But he told you something easy. Just go down the old muddy river, get in it seven times. Get this. You have to quit blaming others for not having your heart's desire. Ooh. That peace in your heart that you desire, it's not somebody else's fault. You need to put your eyes back on Jesus and let him become your delight. He becomes your delight. Not even receiving the heart's desire. That's not your delight. Your delight is in Jesus. You understand that? See, that's the lesson of this thing. Fix your eyes on Jesus. That's what the Bible says. Seeing as we are encompassed about by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every sin and the weight that does so easily beset us and let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Our eyes. Don't look at the other runners. Look at Jesus. That's where our eyes need to go. He needs to become our delight. Not whether or not the Cowboys win or the Astros win. No, no, no. It's Jesus. Jesus is my delight. I delight in my Lord Jesus Christ. And then God grants me the desires of my heart. So let's look for just a second at this thing called healing. Because healing is not an accident either. There are several different types of healing. There can be physical healing. That is defined as you are sick and then you get well. Amen? Amen? So you were sick, you got well. You've been physically healed. Sometimes that may be instantaneous, like with Naaman in the river. He dunked down five times, he was not healed. Dunked down six times, not healed. Dunked down seven times, came up, he was healed instantaneously. The Bible says his skin was like the skin of, of a young child. Wouldn't that be great? I found that as I get older, I get these spots, and I'm kind of like, what are these things? And they said, they're liver spots. I'm going, that's what old people have. <laughs> Oftentimes, the touch of Jesus produced instantaneous healing. Do I believe that there is still instantaneous healing that takes place? I do sometimes. I think it's, I think it's rare, but I do think it is sometimes. It does take place. I, I doubt very seriously it's at the beck and call of many of those television evangelists. If they are, I would love for them to go to Mother Francis and just clear out that place. Amen? Sometimes healing comes through our great doctors in medicine. Amen? And they will be gradually healed. And I believe that God gives us those great doctors. I believe they give us great great. Uh, hospitals, we go there and we pray that God's going to ultimately give the healing, but the, the, God uses those doctors. And you may say, well, Brother Sam, we don't need a doctor. Well, that's not what the Bible says because if, if you look at the author of the Gospel of Luke and the author of the book of Acts, his name was Luke and his profession was he was a physician. And because Paul was in bad health, he carried with him a p physician on the missionary trips and this physician's name was Luke, Amen. So we love our doctors. But any physical healing in this body is always temporary. Because eventually you're going to die. Except the rapture take us out, you're going to die. So you may be healed for a little while, but you're going to get something back 
and then you're going to die. And eventually, as believers, we all have an appointment with Dr. Jesus to receive the ultimate healing. See, that's what Arlen got the other day. He got the ultimate healing. Never be sick again. Never have to go to the doctor again. He's going to get him a brand new body. The old body dies and gets the ultimate healing. See, that's the ultimate act of mercy by God to allow us to die and to get out of this body of sin, to take off this corruption and to put on incorruption. Amen? Woo! That's good stuff. All right. So there's physical healing, but there's also heart healing. Many a heart has been wounded or broken, experiencing hurt and disappointment. I would say that at one time or another, everybody in this auditorium has experienced a broken heart. I don't care who you are. Some, some, and if you have not, get ready because it's coming. You know, when my mom passed away back in 1985, uh, no, 80, 80, 87, I think, I thought, you know, man, I can handle this. I'm a professional. I've been a pastor. I've been there when people have passed away, and, and, and we had six months uh, knowing that she had pancreatic cancer, so we knew she was going to die. We knew she was a Christian and that she loved the Lord Jesus. Uh, she had taught Sunday school for many years and, and, and uh, had done, you know, a lot of really neat stuff and, and had raised me. Of course, that, that, I don't know if that'll be a star or a crown or if she'll lose some points over that one. But, but I thought, you know, I can handle this. This is okay. But I was there when she, when she passed away and the Lord took her. And I can honestly say it felt like somebody took a knife and stuck it in my heart. Never felt pain like that before. And I, and I probably would have given everything I own just to see her breathe one more time. If you've got a broken heart, I want to tell you, you need to come to Dr. Jesus. You, 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 if you're looking for that healing, if you're looking for that, that, that forgiveness, if you're looking to uh, just to get your heart healed, I want you to know something. You need to make your delight in the Lord Jesus Christ. It's not in that individual and not really even in that situation. God will heal your heart if you make Jesus the delight of your heart. But if you focus on the words or the behavior of fallen sinners, or if you delight in broken organizations like a church, then you will live with a broken heart. But God offers you healing. That's why he says, come unto me all you that labor and are heavy laden and I will give you rest. Most important though, there's spiritual healing. This is where your faith turns from idols and self-reliance and you place your faith in the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Then comes spiritual healing. And the neat part about it is because even if you have heart healing, it's only temporary. Eventually somebody else is going to disappoint you. And even if you have physical healing, it's only temporary. But see, this spiritual healing, it's eternal. Amen? I mean, it's going to last forever. Listen to what 2 Kings 5 verse 14 says. Then he, Naaman, went down and dipped himself seven times in the Jordan River, according to the saying of the man of God. And his flesh came again unto him like the flesh of a little child, and he was clean. And he returned to the man of God and to all of his company. And he came and he stood before him and he said, Behold, now I know there is no other God in all the earth but in Israel. Now therefore I take thee, take a blessing of thy servant. There's no doubt Naaman was physically healed for the time being. And his heart was healed in his attitude toward Elisha. But the most important healing he got that day was his spiritual healing. Amen. He said, all the other gods are fake gods. I know the real God. Now it's the God Jehovah of Israel, the land of Israel. So here's our conclusion. What about you? What's your heart's desire today? Would you come looking for a church, a broken heart, forgiveness, peace, joy, restoration? What was your heart's desire? Don't be disappointed because somebody didn't shake your hand or the color of the carpet or the color of the chair or somebody took your end seat when you got in here early and they moved you into the middle. And don't, don't let that become a distraction. May your delight today become Jesus Christ. That when you wake up, you're going, Jesus, I love you. 
Uh, God, you give me breath. God, you give me strength. God, you give me a mind. God, you give me my provision. God, you give me my protection. God, I love you. I don't want to just always be looking at the blessing. I want to be looking at the blesser, and that's Jesus Christ, to make Jesus the delight of your heart. So Naaman comes back, and he says, man, I got gold. I got silver. I got 10 suits from J.C. Penney's. And Elisha says, you can't give me credit for this. That's a Jesus thing. God healed you. Oh, bro, Sam, man, you changed my life. I can't change your life. I probably can't change your light bulb. <laughs> God can if you make him the delight of your heart. Not this church, though this is a great church. I'm telling you, you need to put your eyes back on Jesus Christ. On Jesus. Well, I can't be perfect. I, I can't be perfect, so I just don't even know if I need to make that decision. Here, here's, here's the neat part. Naaman comes up, and you'll read this in the scripture. Naaman comes up and he goes, um, you know, I got to go back to Syria. He said, uh, can I take some dirt with me? <laughs> well, I said, get all you want. And he gets him two big old baskets and puts it on the back of a mule and takes the dirt with him to Syria. And he says, now, there's going to come a day, I know, that I've got to go with my king into the temple of his God. And I got to do this. He said, oh, well, God, forgive me. I don't mean it, I don't, I, but I, I, I got to. And I said, man, I want you to know something. As long as your heart's desire is on the Lord, don't you worry about it. You're here today and you're saying, Brother Sam, I'd love, but, but there are Sundays I can't be here. That's okay. We have to have our police officers. We have to have our hospitals open. We need to have people taking care of our city. That's okay. But don't you lose your heart's desire for Jesus. Amen. Does that understand? But Sam, sometimes I got to go, and oh, my boss, he drinks, and he takes, and I got, I got to go. Hey, as long as you're not in there drinking with him, I understand. God knows that. God knows. But your heart's desire, your heart's desire needs to be focused on Jesus. Amen? It's your heart's desire. He becomes the love of your life. Jesus was talking to the church at Ephesus, and, and he said, y'all are doing so well, but, but, but this one thing, you, this one thing, you've done wrong he said you've left your first love you don't love me like you used to and he said that's going to put you on a bad bad downhill slide what's the greatest commandment Lord thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart with all thy soul with all thy mind with everything you've got and the Bible says when you do that when you make Jesus the focus of your affection and of your heart and you love him like you love no other that he will grant you the desires of your heart because your desires will be the desires of God. Wow, what a great principle. You ought to be writing this in the back of your Bible that when my focus gets off Jesus, my desires get out of whack. But when I put them back on Jesus, my desires get right and he grants me the desires of my heart. Thus saith the Lord, not Sam DeVille, thus saith the Lord. I'm going to ask you to bow your heads and close your eyes. Brother Billy's going to come and lead us in hymn of invitation. Father, I pray that those distractions, the things that take our eyes off of Jesus, God, that you would help us to put blinders on. Oh, God. I cannot help but believe that in a crowd this size that there are people with broken hearts whose marriages are broken, whose hearts are broken. And God, I pray that you would dominate the landscape of their mind. God, when they wake up, they won't be thinking about who so-and-so disappointed me or this circumstance is disappointing or my job is not what I want it to be. That God, you would become dominant in the center of their heart that, 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 that we would love you with all our strength with all our heart with all our mind with everything we've got speak to us now and we will give you glory and praise for it's in Jesus name I pray amen guys this morning we're going to have what's called an invitation 
It's an opportunity for you to respond if God's spoken to your heart. Maybe you're here today and you say, you know, Brother Sam, I am a Christian, but you hit me right between the eyes because my ministry is not what it should be. My marriage, my attitude is not what it should be. And it's all because I've taken my eyes and my heart off of my first love, and that's Jesus. You know, that's what this big old altar's down here for. It's just a great place for Christians to come and kneel down and say, God, help me to fall back in love with you. God, God, I want to be like when I first got saved and how excited I was to to read the Bible and how excited I was to pray and and to witness. Oh, God, I don't want to lose that enthusiasm and, and I don't want to lose the fact that you are my first love. I'll promise you, you come to this altar, nobody's going to bother you. Nobody's going to get you to fill out little cards. It's just a great place to get some things right with God today. Maybe you're here and you say, Brother Sam, we've been looking for a church home, and this is the place God's leading us. We'll have decision counselors down here at the front. All you got to do is come to them and say, God's leading me to be this, come to this church. But I'm going to tell you something. We're a broken people. We're not a perfect church. And if you're perfect and you think you're joining a perfect church, don't join this church because we'll mess you up. But if you want to come on minister with us and join in the mission of Flint Baptist Church, we'd love to have you. But the most important decision, do you know Jesus? Have you put your eyes and focus on Him? That He is the delight of your soul every day. If not, I'd love to introduce you to my Master Jesus. He would change your life. So I'm going to ask you to stand. Billy's going to lead us in hymn of invitation. All over this auditorium, people are praying. As we begin to sing, would you come? Would you come? As we sing, you come. Thank you again for worshiping with us. As a reminder, we have four regular services each week at Flint Baptist Church that are live streamed. Sunday morning at 9 and 10.30 a.m., Sunday evening at 6 p.m., and Wednesday nights at 7 p.m. You can also check out our full website at flintbc.net for other special events and opportunities of service. So, as you've joined us today for a time of worship, if under the conviction of the Holy Spirit, you felt the need to renew a commitment to the Lord, or perhaps for the first time in your life, you've decided to invite Jesus Christ to become your Lord and your Savior, we would love to hear from you. Please feel free to send us an email about this exciting decision to info at flintbaptistchurch.net. God bless you, and thank you so much for worshiping with us today.